Good morning, B Murph. Morning, Chin. Hey, happy morning, Abhinav. What is the logo on your hat? This is Pit Viper. They make sunglasses. And they have a real 90s vibe. Good morning, Mike. hash brown swag did you have hash browns this morning why, why am I even asking of course you did you had like an egg skillet with hash browns um, peppers onions a little bit of mushrooms Jenna says, it was my birthday yesterday, had some awesome cake yesterday. Happy birthday, Jenna. Wait, there has to be some emote I can put in the chat. Corresponding to a birthday. happy birthday okay what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw Bob Ross in there he says happy birthday hash brown says my birthday was in the midst of the quarantine so it was not fun yeah Afro worlder radio says what song is this sounds great let me show you This is called Neon Feel by Matt Wigton. I enjoy that too.
This is Soundstripe. Hey, UB Math Prof. Hope you're doing well today. Welcome. Wait, is it not working? Is it not sending? Is it not sending what it's supposed to send? Lil Z is supposed to put a little doggy in the chat. Ah, oh, I see what you did there, Ben. This song feels more LED than neon to you. Respect. Respect. All right, everybody, we're talking about load transfer. Dr. WD40. Hello. Welcome to the channel. Dr. WD40, don't you do educational content on Twitch? He's part of the community of educators on Twitch, along with UB Math Prof. Welcome. Chen says, has anyone finished part 2C of Project 2? My answer is different with the feedback graph, and I just can't find the bug. My friend has the same situation. Ben says, check the units. Took me forever to figure out. Yeah, check check the units on everything. Make sure you're using the same units as I did. FZ is in Newtons. Yep. Check your units. All right, everybody, let's talk about load transfer. I have an example that we're going to go through that's going to show how load transfer affects the understeer gradient. Actually, we're going to use a Formula SAE car. Dr. WD40 says, yep, going to be reaching out to both of you and UB Math Prof soon to get you added to the Edu Streamer list. We'll worry about that later. Enjoy class. All right, sounds good. Be happy to be on the, the Edu Streamer list. Okay, here's how load transfer affects cornering. So when we talk about load transfer, we're talking about when you make a turn you're going to feel your weight shifting to the outside. So you feel that as the passenger or driver. Um, the rest of your car feels that too, actually. And the tires are um, the ones that get squished. All right, see you, UB Math Prof. And so here's what happens. The net cornering stiffness of the tires at a given axle is reduced by lateral load transfer at that axle. Now, for a given tire, we know that the more load you put on a tire, the cornering stiffness goes up. Um, but that means when you take load away from a tire, its cornering stiffness goes down. Okay, it's like two sides of the same coin. So when you corner, one of the tires at each axle is getting more load, the other tire is getting less load, but the net effect with one gaining cornering stiffness and the other losing is actually the axle as a whole loses a bit of cornering stiffness and it makes your car a little bit weaker in cornering. Now, now we're going to start talking about the proportion of load transfer at your front axle versus your rear axle. Hey, good morning, Hank. Uh, oh yeah, guys, on the Discord, Hank has been putting up YouTube links to um, a show that he's been on this semester. The show is called Sorted, where eight cars across the United States, some from the West Coast, some from the East Coast, uh, they're put through the paces and the competition is to see who has the fastest car in the nation. 
from the reduced sample size of participants. But Hank is in there. Check out the episodes on Discord. It's pretty fun. A lot of the stuff they talk about, you're going to be able to relate it to the class. Okay. If more load transfer occurs at the front axle than the rear axle, the front cornering stiffness, C alpha F, decreases more than the rear cornering stiffness. And if C alpha F decreases more than C alpha R, this makes the car more understeer. Now this is relevant to your project right now. Um, understeer, oversteer, neutral steer. Uh, generally, understeer means that your front tires have a larger slip angle than your rear tires. And as you approach the lateral acceleration limit of a car, it's gonna be your front tires that give out first for an understeer vehicle. And in the project, you're using the bilinear tire model. So you, you actually get to encounter that limit when you do a simulation. If you're simulating the car and one of the tires saturates reaching that maximum lateral force, then that tire's effectively going to start sliding. That's what it'll look like. Um, okay. Now, if more load transfer occurs at the front axle, wait, did I switch this? This one's the front axle. Wait, we should be talking about the rear axle now. Okay, so if more load transfer happens at the rear axle than the front axle, the rear cornering stiffness decreases more than the front cornering stiffness. And this is going to make the car more oversteer. It doesn't necessarily make the car oversteer, but it makes it more oversteer than it is right now. All right, so we're going to show this with an example. We're going to look at how the understeer gradient changes with lateral load transfer. And we're going to look at the formula SAE vehicle. Um, now we're going to look at a formula SAE tire. So this is going to be a single tire. Now the cornering stiffness of a tire can be represented pretty well. Um, with a quadratic function when we're talking about how cornering stiffness changes with normal load. So let's zoom in here. This vertical axis is the cornering stiffness. Horizontal axis is the normal load. And we had, let's see, I have five test points here from some expensive tire test. And what you can do is fit those five points with a quadratic function. And using that, then we have a pretty good prediction of the cornering stiffness at any normal load if it falls in between our test points. All right, so this is what we're gonna use to model the tires as load is transferred. We're gonna assume that each tire has that quadratic relationship. So let's assume the formula SAE vehicle weighs 2,816 newtons with a driver in tow. And let's assume that the weight distribution is 50%. So the CG is right in the middle. Then the static normal load on each tire would be the total weight divided by four. Because if our um, CG is right at the middle, then each tire should be taking a quarter of the load 
and so we have 704 newtons. If you move the CG closer to the front, then the front tires take more, so on and so forth. So in this case, assuming that each tire is equally loaded, we can use our quadratic formula for the cornering stiffness as a function of the normal load. And this is what we're gonna get. So I'm just gonna use that formula up there. 704 squared plus 53 times 704 plus 1670 newtons per radian. And this means each tire has 34,021 newtons of lateral force per radian of slip angle. Now, when we use the bicycle model, because our understeer gradient is defined with respect to the bicycle model, we assume that the front tires are combined into, together into like a super front tire. The rear tires are combined into like a super rear tire. So, um, basically, the front combined cornering stiffness is just going to be two times that. Sixty-eight thousand and forty-one newtons per radian, and because the load on the rear tires is the same, the combined rear cornering stiffness is going to be the same as the front. All right, now I want to calculate the understeer gradient, and you might already know what the understeer gradient is because the weight is evenly distributed, the cornering stiffness at the front and rear is equal. So this is the formula for the understeer gradient. And if you look at this term in the numerator, which in terms of our, uh, what are they called? Yaw moment derivatives in beta. I think this is called the directional stability derivative. If you calculate this out for this configuration of the car, this difference goes to zero. So under these static loading conditions where every tire is equally loaded, we would call this a neutral steer car. All right. But now that we're getting more advanced and we're considering load, load transfer, this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. Let's assume that this vehicle is not just sitting statically on the pavement anymore. Let's assume it's cornering at 1G of lateral acceleration. In this case, let's look at the amount of load that's going to be transferred from the inside of the car to the outside of the tire uh, of the car. In order to do this, we have to know how high the CG is from the pavement. Let's say it's 0.23 meters, which I think is nine or 10 inches. And I think that's typical for formula SAE vehicles. And let's assume the, the track width at the front and the rear is 1.2 meters. So that's the distance between the center line of the front tires. Okay, so this delta FZ, this is the amount of load transferred from inside to outside. And we have a formula for this that we got last time. It's the mass of the car times your lateral acceleration, times the height of your CG divided by the track width. All right, so let's just plug and chug. 287 kilograms, we're cornering at 1G, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. We got the height of the CG, basically a quarter of a meter 
and we're dividing by the track width 1.2 meters and this comes out to 539.6 newtons so 540 newtons is taken away from the inside of the car and added to the outside of the car All right, so now, because we're gonna start talking about suspension, let's assume that our suspension is designed, because you can do this, such that 60% of that load transfer happens at the rear axle. You can change this distribution with your suspension. So, we're going to look at the normal load on all four tires in this case. All right. So we're going to have the normal load at the front inner tire. So every tire, it's going to start with the static normal load. So let's just start with um, this. This is how much load is on the tire when it's just chilling on the pavement. 50% front rear weight distribution. Every tire is equally loaded. Okay, now we said the rear tires, when we're cornering at 1G, they're going to get 60% of the load transfer happening right there. So we know the rear outer tire, it's going to get some extra normal load. And it's going to get 60% of the total of the total. And the inner tire, it's going to lose that much. So this is 60% of the load transfer happening at the rear axle so the rear tire it now has instead of 704 newtons it has minus 380 newtons and the outer tire at the rear it's going to have minus 1028 newtons so notice there, there's a big difference between how the inner and outer tires are loaded okay so 60 percent happened at the rear so the remaining 40 percent is going to happen at the front so the outer front tire it's going to get this much extra the inner tire is going to lose that amount and remember i'm everything is negative right now because in the sae coordinate system z goes into the pavement so positive z direction but normal load goes out of the pavement onto the tire so it's in the negative z direction so that's why it has to be negative okay so minus 488 newtons at the front inner tire and minus 920 newtons at the front outer tire Now this becomes, this gets kind of interesting when you start considering a four tire model for a car and you consider load transfer. Every tire during a race is loaded differently. And the, the difference between those loads is actually significant. Like all of these are separated by a huge amount of force. And it's just interesting that racing is really dynamic like that. When you start cornering the load on the tires, it, it changes a lot. So, okay, 40% transfer at front, 60% at rear. That's what we're showing right there. Okay, now what I wanna do is look at how the cornering stiffness has changed. Each tire is going to have a unique normal load, resulting in a unique cornering stiffness. 
So let's do inner outer once again. So we're going to look at the uh, front tires, the front inner tire. It now has, if you use that quadratic formula earlier, this is its new cornering stiffness. It lost cornering stiffness because it lost normal load. The outer tire gained cornering stiffness. Now, if we want to talk about the combined cornering stiffness at the front, which we're going to need to calculate the understeer gradient, you just add those two together, both your front tires, and you're going to get 67,120 newtons per radian of combined front cornering stiffness. What was it before? It was 68,000 before. So when the tires were statically loaded, 68,000 newtons per radian. But now that we're cornering and load was transferred, the net cornering stiffness went down by almost uh, almost 1,000 newtons per radian. And it's going to be even um, an even larger reduction at the rear because we have more load transfer at the rear. So at the rear inner tire, this is the tire that lost the most load. It has the smallest cornering stiffness of all four tires. The rear outer tire gained the most load, so it's going to have the most cornering stiffness of all four tires. So our combined rear, you just add those numbers together, 65,000. All right, so this just shows you the more load transfer you have at a given axle, that's th those two sets of tires, they're gonna relatively lose the most cornering stiffness. Okay, so let's make some comments here. Then we're gonna get the understeer gradient. So notice that the total cornering stiffness at each axle, axle <laughs> is less than when the tires are at static load. Next, the rear axle where most of the load transfer occurred had a greater reduction of cornering stiffness. Okay, I quickly want to point something out that I just thought of. So, um... Basically, according to this example, when a car is cornering, the more lateral acceleration it has, that actually lowers the potential of those tires to corner, in a way. Um, so how can we combat this? If you think about a formula car, Hold on, there's the music that's going on right now is really cacophonous and I can't even think. Okay, that's better. Um, if you think about a formula car, they have um, wings at the front and the rear. So aerodynamic surfaces that increase the downforce. So a formula car, even when it's cornering, it has additional downforce that comes from just the fact that the car is moving faster. The higher its velocity is, the higher the normal load is on the car because we're not just considering the weight. There's the weight, and then on top of that, there's the aero downforce that gets in there. So um, just keep, keep that in mind. This example where I'm losing cornering stiffness in a corner that's just the effect of lateral load transfer in isolation. And I'm just considering the weight of the car shifting. Okay. So the understeer gradient in this case, after all the load transfer occurred, 
So we're going to do the understeer gradient formula. The mass of the car divided by its wheelbase, which is 1.6 meters. You take the rear cornering stiffness and you multiply that by the distance from the rear axle to the CG. You subtract the front cornering stiffness times the distance from the front axle to the CG. And then you just divide by the product of the front and rear cornering stiffness. And now you're going to see the understeer gradient is no longer zero, but it's this negative number. So whereas we initially calculated the car to be neutral steer, under these cornering conditions, the car is oversteer. because the understeer gradient is less than zero. So this is something you have to consider as a race car engineer that we've been talking about the understeer gradient as like a static thing. But once you start to corner, once load is being transferred, the understeer gradient is always changing as you move around a track. And depending on where the load transfer is occurring, if it's if more load transfer is happening at the rear, your car is going to become more oversteer in cornering. Very interesting. Okay, let's jump over to the second handout for today because we're going to start to talk about how you can manipulate how much load is transferred at the front versus the rear. No, oh, wait. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh man, I attached some pure gold YouTube videos here. We might just take a sneak peek at these, but if you go back and watch these in their entirety, really fantastic. Okay. Yep, outside tires gain load, inside tires lose load. That's load transfer. All right, all right, all right. The total load transfer from inner to outer. We're just hammering home this idea. So when you think about the geometry of a car, if you want to reduce load transfer, you can reduce the mass, you can lower the CG height, you can increase the track width. Those are all recipes for a formula car. Okay, so you can change those parameters to modify the total load transfer. Now, when you start talking about modifying the relative amount of load transfer at the front versus rear axle, you're going to be adjusting the suspension. And like we just saw in an example, more load transfer at the front is going to make the car more understeer than it is right now. And more load transfer at the rear makes the car more oversteer. Now, it's important at this point to talk about the transfer of force eventually to the CG of the car. So from studying tires, the first place that this load transfer occurs is at the road tire interface. There's a lateral force from the road onto the tires. That's where it starts. Then this lateral tire force goes into the 
suspension and then it's ultimately transferred to the sprung mass which is all the mass above your suspension um let me give you a sneak peek of the second video here it's going to make you want to work for mercedes formula one Where are you? All right, here we go. The suspension system of a Formula One car forms right, we probably a critical won't, we won't watch the whole between thing. the performance generating components of power unit, chassis, aerodynamics, and tires. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that the design, manufacture, and setup of suspension is an extremely complex affair. We manufacture all of our suspension in-house. This is because they're very complex and also they're what we call safety critical items. They're structural items and the safety of the car and the driver depend on them. We make them in-house because we can control the quality, we're using expensive materials and we need precision. The biggest challenges in designing Formula One suspension are to make the trade-offs between the strength, the weight and the physical size of the suspension. And I say the size because these components are in the airstream. They have a huge effect on the car aerodynamics. So we need to minimize that effect. But at the same time, they are structural safety critical devices and we have to achieve the strength. And then we have to minimize the weight. So this means altogether, this is one of our big structural challenges and big manufacturing challenges that we have in Formula One. And now we can look at the three main parts of a Formula One suspension system. We have the inboard suspension, hidden away underneath the bodywork, where we have the springs and the dampers and the anti-roll bar. And here, hidden away under the tyre, we have the outboard suspension, which That's is the upright, the wheel bearings, and the axle. That's the first interesting thing about Formula One suspensions. Like, usually when we think suspension, we think of a big spring, like a big coilover spring or something that you can see very close to where the tyre is mounted to the car. And when you look at a Formula One car, you don't see any springs. Well, it has this interesting suspension system where the springs are actually like hidden in the nose. And there's these complex linkages that connect, like you got the wishbones over here that, that ultimately connect all of these linkages to the spring. But it's just kind of hidden away. It's, it's more aerodynamic. And in between the parts that you can see, which are the wishbone elements and the steering rod, which are the only items that really see the external airflow. In designing all three of these, common theme is stiffness. We have to have the wheel position controlled as accurately as possible. Outboard, we're looking at the challenges of high temperatures. They're close to the brakes. Inboard, we have the complex components, the hydraulic system, the dampers, the springs, the anti-roll bars. And in the middle, in the leg elements, we have the structural and aerodynamic challenge. You'll hear a lot in Formula One, drivers and engineers talking about balance. The reason is that these four tyres behave differently every part of the track, every corner of the track. And what we want to do is to control the relative amount of grip of those four tyres as the driver goes through the different phases of the corner and the circuit. What the suspension allows us to do is to change minutely the amount of grip that those four tires generate at any one point on the track. And the way we do that is by adjusting the inboard settings of the suspension, by adjusting the damping and adjusting what we call the mechanical balance. That's because with that adjustment, we control the change of grip from the rear axle to the front axle. And that depends on the car speed and the track conditions. When we're running the car on the... Okay, we'll stop this there. Go back, check out this video because it's really, really sweet. But that's the, that's the gist um, that, like we just showed in the other example, the normal load on all four tires changes as a function of your lateral acceleration in a corner. And um, that affects the understeer grading of a car and its handling performance at any time. 
And so in a formula car or any performance vehicle, you're tuning your suspension to try to adjust the amount of load that's transferring at the front and rear to adjust the grip at each individual tire. It's um, totally Track. fascinating. We make sure that we... Okay. Let's go here. All right. Let us... Okay. All right, so how does suspension change the amount of load transferred at the front and the rear? So first we have to talk about how force travels from the tire through the suspension to the CG of the car in the first place. So let's see. If you condense all the forces applied to the sprung mass, so the mass above the suspension, to a point load, this force is applied at what we call the roll center of the car. This is going to be important because the roll center, that's kind of the axis about which the car is rolling. You could think of it that way. And that's going to change the amount of load transfer at the front and the rear. So how can you find the roll center? Actually, from the Millikan textbook. So imagine you're looking at a formula car from the front you have um, your tires so maybe you have FY maybe we'll call these like my inner tires out so we're, we're cornering that direction right and then force is going to travel through these linkages. And I guess on this side, this tire is kind of pulling that way. Like these should be in tension, right? Okay. Now, What the roll center is about is that we have these loads coming in along different linkages, and so there's like uh, different application points. But what if we could reduce those forces to just like a point force and say, okay, I have one force acting on the chassis. Okay, so that's where that force is going to be applied is the roll center which is right here, designated RC. And they're kind of marking it with this symbol that we would generally use for marking the CG, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in, um, in this case. So, geez, I'm having trouble just drawing a nice horizontal arrow. So, FY, the total lateral force, is going to happen at that roll center. Now, you can find where the roll center is at any given time by doing this instantaneous center analysis. And we're not going to spend too much time on that, but let me give you kind of the gist here. I'm just going to I'm just going to get rid of these markings right here. I want to be able to show you this. Okay, so what you do if you want to find the roll center is you look at each control arm. So I'm going to take this like top left one and you draw a line parallel to that and you just like extend it out. Then you take the next one and it however many control arms there are you'll have to do this you extend it out and they're going to intersect at some point and that's the instantaneous center for that set of um 
for, for that suspension, that side of the suspension. What that means is, um, even though we have two linkages here that we're pivoting about, there's like two pin joints here, the instantaneous center is a way of reducing it to effectively one pin joint. And so you could say like, as this tire moves up and down and kind of like rotates, it's equivalently rotating about that center over there. And now I just marked this up even more. Let's delete that. Okay, so you find the instantaneous center for this side. You do the same thing for the other side. So I'm following that arm. I'm following this arm. You find another instantaneous center. Now to find the roll center, you go to the, con the center of the contact patch for this tire. And then you connect it to the instantaneous center for that side of the suspension. So like the two pink lines, that was our instantaneous center for this side. So I go from the center of the contact patch on that side, and I draw a line connecting to that instantaneous center. Do the same thing for the other side. Oops, and then connect to the instantaneous center from that side. And those lines from the tires on the left side and the right side to their respective instantaneous centers, those are going to intersect at a point. That is the roll center. And you're going to have a roll center at the front of the car. And you're going to have a roll center at the rear of the car because the suspension linkages at the front versus the rear might be different. Now, how high that roll center at the front or the rear is off the ground, that's the roll center height. And I mean, just looking at this, you can see it's, it's very close to the ground. Now, the roll center, it doesn't always have to be on the axis of symmetry of the car, you know, right, uh, right along like the longitudinal axis. In this example, if you carry out that same analysis, you'll find that the roll center is way off to one side of the car. I think that's how it is for NASCAR vehicles, right? Because they only turn one direction. So they play with the, <coughs> if you're only turning one way, you can like optimize the car for turning left. Because you never have to turn right, you know? So it, it can be advantageous to, to skew the load transfer that way, to try to evenly load the tires. Okay. So imagine that you find the roll center at the front and the rear. Now let's take a side view. All right, we got a side view here. Here is our front roll center. So it's, it's this guy. But now I'm just looking from the side. And then let's imagine we did the same thing at the rear axis. And we find the, the rear roll center. And remember, the, the meaning of the roll center in terms of forces, this is where all of the forces, like at the front axle, are reduced to a point load on the chassis. So it's kind of like a, a theoretical thing where it's if all those loads were concentrated at one point, this is where they would act. Same thing at the rear. So, okay, let's see here. 
So let, let's introduce some terms. I called this H R sub F, the height of the roll center at the front axle. So you just see it's the height of that roll center above the pavement at the rear, the height of the roll center at the rear axle. Boom. Now we also have the height of the CG above the pavement, which we know this is important for, because we have a formula for calculating the total load transfer, right? And that depends on the height of the CG from the ground. So you just find how tall that is from the pavement. Okay, so we have those three heights. Now, if you connect the front and rear roll centers, that's what we call our roll axis. At an instantaneous moment in time, well, I guess that's the definition of a moment in time. Um, you can imagine the car rolling about this axis. This axis changes during uh, car movement, uh, if you think about it. Because as a car moves, as it rolls, these suspension arms, they rotate themselves. And like in that Formula One video, they do some animations, right? Like as the car moves around, those control arms move. And so you could do this analysis to find the roll center at any moment in time. And you're going to find that the roll axis actually changes. Now for the analysis in this class, we're going to assume that the roll axis just remains the same to simplify things. But just keep that in mind that the roll axis could always be changing. Now given the roll axis... You can define, I know it's like tiny, 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 tiny here. You could define the height of the CG above the roll axis. That's going to become important too. Okay, so we have like those four heights, the height of the CG at the front axle, rear axle, the height of the CG itself, and then if we connect the roll centers, we get a roll axis, we can get the height of the CG above the roll center. So we're running out of time, but just as a sneak preview for next time, I made this beautiful figure. Oh my goodness. But what we're going to do is um, we're going to do the sum of moments about the CG up here, um, considering the forces from the front and the rear. We're going to label all these dimensions, the roll center height, and so on and so forth. And from using Newton's second laws, we're going to get an expression... Uh, it's going to depend on the suspension stiffness, all this geometry to determine, well, number one, what this roll angle should be as you're cornering. And then depending on this roll angle, depending on how stiff your front and rear uh, suspension springs are, that's going to change the relative load at the front and the rear. So that, that's kind of the, the idea here. Very cool. Go check out, go check out these videos. Actually, this, this video from 1938 that describes, uh, this one, this video is not so much about load transfer. It's, it's about the vertical motion that's damped out by suspension. I'm going to give you a sneak preview of this. This it's it's just amazing. Let me show you what I love about this. They set up this little Solve experiment. This problem. Here is a wheel fastened so that it is free to move up and down. The wheel rolls on a moving belt, rising and falling 
whenever it strikes a bump. A platform fastened solidly to the wheel carries a tracing pen. And when the wheel moves up and down, the tracing pen draws a line which shows the movement of the platform. To get a true picture of the up and down movements, the tracing paper moves at the same speed as the moving ground belt. We'll start the model running. Now, so now this is the without trace suspension. line gives us an exact picture of the up and down movements of the wheel and platform. Let's see what happens when we use more speed. At high speeds, the we can mount a fairly and then stiff then spring they add like a, the platform a spring. to see how it will affect the jolting. Now, let's and they watch do it, it again. in slow motion photography. And then they keep the increasing, the bump, you have to go back and watch this. They, they keep recently, increasing the complexity. The front springs of the so now they're like, we have, have stiff front springs, rear springs. And front wheels in line. If one set of springs is stiffer than the other set, the stiff set will bounce harder and faster. We can see that this unequal spring, stiff springs in front and soft springs in rear, causes pitching when the wheels strike equal springing and make the front spring soft. Is now and then the they, can be then they the say, okay, let's replace this with like a double wishbone, arms. looking the more modern. Pivoted, so that and they describe the exactly like how this works. Bump, the wheel remains vertical and then they add a spring in there. The swinging arms keep the front wheels in line. There is only one job left for our springs to do. A problem. Springs that are of shock absorbers. And then they even the add shock little absorber shock absorbers. Like but they build this up very basic, little by little, adding layer upon layer of complexity. It'll give you a much better idea of what the suspension does and how it actually watch this one at the end when they put the all the pieces together with their shock absorbers spread out the effect of you any see how the tires are moving quite a bit absorb. due to the road but of course in actual practice where strength and safety I know are of maximum yeah everyone importance, <laughs> engineers have made use of these same bump absorbing and you know the craziest thing I think this educational video was a commercial for Chevrolet. I was reading some of the comments below this video. It's like, this is when marketing, it wasn't just about feeling. It was like, hey, let me, let me show you the engineering here. Let me explain to you the inner workings and like let that kind of be a selling point. But yeah, they go from that little model and then they say like, okay, now let's look at how a real car is kind of just like that model with, with a little bit of added complexity, you know? Um, man, yeah, these videos, they're, they're fantastic. They are totally fantastic. And th there's some, I haven't, I feel like there's a series of these. Like we watched the transmission video, which was just amazing. Um, I haven't watched this one. This is probably the best video on brakes you could ever watch. Is covered with friction producing oh, man. Brakes. See, that? Th now I want to watch all of these. Uh, ben says, then it turned into hitting jumps with trucks, then hamsters driving. Yeah. <laughs> Advertising has changed um, a little bit. Look at this. Floating rear axle. Was placed over the rear. Oh man, we. Ugh. They're so good. And look at the look at that guy's mustache too. That's what's going on there, right? He has like this nice uh, handlebar. Hank says, "When people were smarter, yeah, maybe. <laughs> At least it was just." It was more straightforward. Well, at least I don't know. I don't know. All right, everybody. 
thank you for your attention today. Hope you enjoy. Cooler commercials, but also polio. <laughs> Hey, you, you you can't you can't get it all, right? Um, it's one or the other. <laughs> Hank says no one cares anymore because no one can understand it, so people just give up. Man, when this was new, it must have been so interesting to see the entirety of the world must have wanted to know how it works. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I agree to an extent that, no, I mean, cars have become more complex, especially with electronics and stuff. I mean, I've heard people say, you know, you used to be able to open a hood, be like, okay, I know what's going on here. Now, when you look under the hood, it's like, I don't know what this means. I cannot work on this vehicle, but like the basics of suspension, I think they remain unchanged. And even when you have a complex multi-link suspension, it's the same sort of principle going on. The goal of a suspension is to improve the ride of the vehicle it's to improve load transfer characteristics um hey have a good one hank think belkut says things have become complex that they can't understand it unfortunately when i talk to my non-engineering friends about engineering they say whoa how do you know all this stuff i, I don't know like it I don't know. I feel like the, the basic principles are still there. We don't have to um, Yeah, I guess I'm saying I don't know if the concepts have gotten more complex. really fun stuff all right everyone have a fantastic Wednesday we're gonna be back here on Friday uh, continue making progress on your team project seems like people are doing very well figuring it out um, hey, have a wonderful day, MCAT. On to 451, have a good one. Hey, guys, enjoy. Enjoy design processes with Dr. Rehanian. Does he still bring uh, Neo onto the, onto the stream? Neo's getting huge. His golden doodle. See you, Jenna. Have a great day. Ben says linear tire model on the project is with the matrices, right? Yes, when we when we derived the state space model, the linear state space model, we assumed the linear tire model.
MCAT says, such a good little pupper. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks. Never gave it uh, a title in my notes. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, linear tire model, all it means is the lateral force is the negative of the cornering stiffness times the tire slipping. That's all it means. Peace, everybody.